Hey, hi everybody. Hey, this is Bar Down Breakdown. Uh, this is like episode one million or something. I don't know. Uh, we have with us super cool. We've got our homeboy Ty from Sinkin, the l- loving all that stuff from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Rocking the Hershey Bears. Love it, man. Ty, what's going on, man? How are you this evening? What's going on, boss? How you doing? Dude, loving that, man. Um, so it's it's funny. The I was uh, I, I was in like a like a sort of like a an alternative y kind of, I don't know, screamo we band for like a hot second. We did like a weekend tour and um we came through like Lancaster and like the Hershey area and uh we we're trying really hard to get to a Bears game because like the Bears have just been like one of the premier teams, uh, you know, in the AHL for like ever, you know. So uh, we were all trying to do it. We couldn't do it. It was such a bummer. But um, I love the Hershey area, man. It, it, it's it's great stuff. But enough about my experiences, because who cares about what I think? Let's talk about you. Let's talk about sinking. <laughs> so um, first and foremost, uh you know, I would love to kind of hear about the genesis of Sinkin, how you guys, you know, got your start um, and, uh, you know, how how it's evolved into, uh, you know, kind of where you guys are now. So just give me a little bit of insight, man, please. Yeah, well, first off, I always have to rep the Hershey stuff. I'm no longer in Hershey. I'm in Los Angeles. Okay. So uh, I, I appreciate there's still there's a there's a few people whenever I come go to any like hockey related event that still know what this Jersey means. And it's fun. It's funny. Cause you, you get the, the kind of like, Hey man, I get that. That, <laughs> that is a real deep cut. And I appreciate that. There's like a real deep yeah, hockey man. appreciation for any, any relevancy when it comes to, to Hershey. So I, I like, I like still having that. Yeah. Um, yeah man. But yeah. Uh, so sink in uh, the majority of, of sink in started in central Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Um, good old, good old Lancaster and Harrisburg scene yep. growing up to going to shows at the, at, at the champ, uh, at chameleon club rest yep. in peace of both of those venues over the past yeah. year, man. Yep. But, um, it, uh, at, at I'm 26. So when I was in high school and middle school, it was right at the, the turn of the, the metal core scene in Lancaster. Yeah. August burns red had just blown up Texas sure. in July. This yep. of the apocalypse yep. legendary bands for that style. I mean, they, that really that style was created in the Lancaster area. Mm-hmm. So we were super lucky, super lucky to grow up. And that like, I, I didn't, I, I don't take it for granted now, but I had no idea how thankful I should have been in those moments that like, I was, I was seeing August burns red play in Mac Reiner's farm, like <laughs> barnyard, yeah. you know? Like, that's awesome, man. That's I mean, I, c- comeback kid playing in really like somebody's kitchen on like a Monday night. Sure. You know, like it was. I had no idea how special we had it back then. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's a, a sinking kind of stemmed from that. Uh, a bunch of kids who uh, really wanted to, wanted to try something outside of the metalcore realm, mm-hmm. and everybody in Central Pennsylvania <laughs> hated it. So we had to start playing markets outside of central Pan- Pennsylvania real fast. Sure. <laughs> That's how sinking got started. <laughs> so what scene did you kind of gravitate towards? Because y- you guys are like kind of, you know, genre mixing where you have some like pop elements and like electronic, but then you also have some like pop punk influence that mm-hmm. you can hear in there. Yeah. Like, I'm even hearing the audition. Do you remember the audition? They were a victory records band oh, from like way I, back. I, I do. I do. Yeah. So like I was getting, I'm and getting I, all those vibes. Pipes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He does. So like what scene did you gravitate towards? Like, were you in like that Philly pop punk scene or did you have to like go to like the Jersey scene? Like where, where did you guys find your home then? We never really did. And that was a real <laughs> problem getting yeah. started. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but I mean that sincerely, like we just kind of, uh, we, I think we play right when we started our style, you're, you're mentioning bands that had already achieved success. 
And the problem is I don't, I don't think there was really any bands getting started, any like DIY bands off the ground mm-hmm. that were doing what we were doing. Uh, like it was, it was either like, it was either us or wildly successful bands. Mm -hmm. so there was nobody with nobody for us to kind of grow with and we had to learn and adapt from that uh Mm -hmm. and that was a major problem another thing too is um honestly we realized uh a lot of the uk bands still do um kind of have this belief that like right now the uk scene is always five years ahead of the american scene and the americans don't know it until it's happening Mm -hmm. so you know you're looking at that right now with like don broco yeah. Uh, you're looking at that with, um, I mean, Enter Shikari is never going to be the arena band here yeah. that they are in mm-hmm. the UK. But like, you know, they're still like that new record is still really kind of starting to push in the states. Mm-hmm. Lower than Atlantis for a minute I was starting to come across the state. Atlantis. We, we, love yeah, that. we, uh, that was that was our lane. Yeah. So it was this whole thing of like, man, like we're gonna we're gonna kind of develop our own version of what the UK is doing right now because sure. I think that they're really ahead of our mm-hmm. of, of where of where we are in our scenes in the states and like we're gonna show that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, that made it hard off the bat because we didn't know who to play with. Like yeah. you know, we were pretty seasoned when it came to like DIY touring, mm-hmm. um, so we could book shows right off the bat and kind of just go play local regional markets. But like it was a real difficult conversation to figure out like well who do we try and stack bills with? Do we yeah. like do we go the metalcore route where we're the pop band or do we go the full pop route where we're like the punky band or do we do the pop punk shows? But then the pop punk shows are like so that I mean, it like it's kind of hard to get local pop punk kids to listen to anything but pop punk. At yeah, the time. Like it's right, so yeah. what do you do? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was a, that was a really hard business yeah. decision at the time. I still think it's hard. I mean, I think we make that decision every single day with how we operate the band in the business and maybe we're sure. not getting it right, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we've talked about it so often, how there are so many bands that have kind of started in one sphere and ended up developing into a different sphere sphere. And like, you know, one of the, the albums that I think really showcases that if you're a fan, um, uh, the band Citizen. So, I mean, you know, as they started, you know, when you look at Youth as a record, that record is just like a very just gritty kind of pop punk record. And now, you know, over six, seven years, four albums, they've evolved into essentially like uh, like a more alternative, like almost like nineties, some elements of like, you know, power pop and electronica. And like, so I I think there's something to be said about bands that can develop, but I think that now uh, versus even five years ago, I think that because so many bands are are doing this, so many bands are evolving. I think that the, the listener is able to like allow more straying from the norm than, than maybe, in, in in years past you know I, I mean when you look at it just you know how a band like turnover changed how a band like hundredth changed i mean you know how oh, a band man. like yeah. you know so but like citizen balance and composure all these bands uh even a band like grayscale you know i mean like grayscale is one of those bands that you know from where they where they were to nella vita i mean you know they've completely kind of opened themselves up so i think that probably now in 2021 outside of the pandemic because uh, it's fuck pandemic but um i think that like, <laughs> like the wheelhouse that you guys are in is probably the most accessible to fans now than it's been because a lot of people are, are for it a lot of people are for genre bending and a lot of people are for not conforming to a specific oh we're a pop punk band or a, you know we're this we're that so it's really super cool to hear you guys kind of swirling all that in and i hope that you guys are on the right path i mean to me what i'm listening to it seems like you are so uh but you know that's where we are though we're 2021 so having said that uh where we are today and you know now that people are getting vaccinated and we're on the way towards maybe being able to open up you're starting to see tour dates and stuff start to materialize again um what are your plans for sink in ideally you know, under the assumption that we don't have another crisis, um, right. you know, what, what, what are your plans for the band? Where do you want it to go? So uh, right now we've kind of just 
closed up shop and we've been working on the back end of just making making a record sure, sure um, okay we we our our plan had to change so drastically i mean obviously as yeah, buddies when it came to the pandemic but yeah of course we were dead set on our trajectory is our summer schedule of 2020 we mm-hmm. had been put on some of the biggest festivals we had ever been put on wow. had, like a bunch that we had not been not announced mm-hmm. that like it was our whole thing was like hey this is this is going to open us up to more people than we've ever played in front of sure. our entire lives mm-hmm. and we've kind of always prided ourselves as being a live band and like yeah. we're going to we're going to punch them in the face with a live show and then back that mm-hmm. up with a with a record Love and it. all of that mm-hmm. fell through and we weren't prepared yeah we really weren't you know is cuz you got to keep in mind too we're dealing with we're we're now I'm in Los Angeles Cabretti is in Pennsylvania. Josh mm-hmm. is in Southern Illinois. Wow. So we have logistical things that come into play when it comes oh, yeah. to, you know, making a record in the middle of the pandemic. Like mm-hmm. Zoom writing sessions were a thing <laughs> for a very long time. I believe it. Um, right. Uh, but uh, so we just kind of had to like completely change our tra- trajectory here. And we've been, you know, we put out just like a quick little single that was just like a, like really just self DIY recorded, mm-hmm. just like a little flavor thing in the middle but you know we've been we've been working on these songs now in the studio i mean songs written over this past you know the 14 months now sure. and i will say a cool thing uh that i think has happened for a lot of bands like us is we've never had this much time to work on music like the the by the time by the time our first single is going to come out i'm going to absolutely hate it because i wrote it two <laughs> years ago i yeah, hate sure. it no, i understand that. but like getting to the point that you hate it <laughs> means that you've like toiled over it enough that it's that like I've never had that much time to perfect something. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that can eventually be a curse, but I think for a band like us right now, it's, uh, it, it's exciting for us. Like mm-hmm. I have, I have four different versions of songs right now where if you listen, listen to version one that we thought was a finalized song. And then you listen to version two, you would have no idea it's the same song. Of course. And yeah. as really cool that we're able to do that right now. And I hope that that pays yeah. off. I think, and I think that's a that's something that a lot of listeners, uh, you know, hopefully don't take for granted is the fact that, you know, with all of this extra time, which is, you know, it's a bummer, but at the same time, you know, you are now looking back at at this music that you're just retooling and retooling to make it the best that it could be, where you know, if if these were normal times and you had a grueling touring schedule, you know, you'd maybe only have, you know, okay, I've got six weeks at home that I could you know, write this music and you write it to the best of your ability. And now you're out in a van for three to four months. So there's, there is some silver lining in all of this, but um, so of course, it, you know, it's such a bummer to hear that you guys kind of had to put all of the, um, the upward trajectory on hold. But um, so as far as, you know, the festivals and all that, uh, you know, should, are any of them rematerializing and will you guys have those opportunities again? Um, so there's a, I don't really know how this is going to work. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. The, the email nowadays is filled with, Hey, this is the date that we're going to play. Yep. But you can't announce it yet. And we're also not going to give you the contract until you can announce it. And mm-hmm. then if you can't announce it. We might not have the budget to give you the contract. So maybe you're not even playing. <laughs> like that's Jeez. the, that's verbatim what every single email is right now in my inbox. It's nuts. That's awful. <laughs> but, that uh, terrible. but I mean, it's cool. Like it, look, it's, I, I'm excited for it because it's better than nothing. Like it's, it's definitely on its, on, on its way up. Mm-hmm. But um, interesting one that I, that I saw, which I'm not, I'm not giving away sources here, <laughs> but uh, there was, there was an email uh, going around that said, I don't know when you guys are going to put this out. But there's a big UFC fight coming up. Okay. Uh, I think it's like the 25th or the 26th mm-hmm. that yep. is um, back in front of a regular audience. Yeah. I mean, if it's not full capacity, it's like almost full capacity. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of larger entertainment promoters have their eyes on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and in reality, it's not for whether or not cases go up or down in the area, it's really for seeing what the public eye is going to view it as. of course yeah the scrutiny um, of it yeah right so that you know they were essentially saying like hey whether you want to believe it or not like the future of music in this summer depends on whether or not this ufc fight is a success mm-hmm. uh, yeah it's, it's really it's, weird yeah i mean it's crazy to think about but you know so i'm a i'm a big professional wrestling fan and they just did uh two nights of, of wrestlemania uh in raymond james stadium in tampa bay 
uh, wasn't at full capacity, but it was 25,000 people. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I mean, it seemed to have gone off without a hitch. Um, I, I don't know, you know, as far as reporting numbers for if it was like a super spreader event or anything, but I know they were carefully trying to keep distance between people and trying to, uh, it, you know, administer health checks and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, you, you hope that, you know, everything hinging on this one particular event uh, ends up going well, but I, this is kind of the, the narrative that we're in now. You know, right. it's, it's where, you know, everybody wants to get back to playing. Everybody wants to be, you know, in a space where they can, you know, start to like grow their fan base and make money again. But it's like, we have to do it safely. And, you know, it has to be okay in the scrutiny of the public eye because so many people are just like, you know, have this like kind of like anger and like vitriol against trying to get back to normal. Yeah. Even which with is all fa- everything. Which is fair. Yeah, and which it is, is, I agree. Yeah. Fair. I mm-hmm. mean, I will say I, so I went to, I was along with that whole party of scene people who took over NASCAR for a weekend at Vegas. I don't mm-hmm. know if you saw that, but it was the yeah. uh, the avoids avoids legendary national anthem. And then Lil Aaron was there, and he ended up sponsoring a car. Uh, like it was just a weekend of just everybody in the music scene from LA just came and was a part of that of that race uh, because mm-hmm. Nate is now working for Joe Graff, um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's insane. But so that was, I think it was ten thousand people. Now, granted, that's a NASCAR. Yeah. Uh, grandstand which then mm-hmm. holds a hundred thousand people that's not it's just you know it, it looks like a couple of ants on a full yard like it's not it's not the yeah. same but yeah it was probably the most encouraging thing when it came to the entire conversation of like returning to shows because it was run so well mm-hmm. i mean i i felt now i i was already vaccinated at that point but like i kind of went like okay i'm gonna treat this as if like i wasn't and like would i be skeptical of this Mm -hmm. And they ran it so well. It felt safe the entire time. So many extra precautions were done at a NASCAR race, which like, let's be honest, like I feel like people (laughs) would think that NASCAR would would be like the least concerned when it comes to, you know, the public eye of how Mm -hmm. how, how COVID is being treated. But they were like, I I felt not, there was never a moment that weekend where where I felt like "Mm, I'm putting myself in a weird situation, which was cool. It was very exciting. No, and and that's awesome. And, And, you know, like I said, the whole, you know, the whole idea behind this is just making sure that people can get back to being able to enjoy music, being able to enjoy events, you know, and, and do it safely. So, you know, as long as, as things are, are run operationally well, and as long as, you know, the proper health ordinances are in place, I, I think that this is something that the world can get back to. Uh, but the other thing I, I really do love is, uh, you know, you see a lot of bands you know musicians specifically that have been doing these um you know kind of online performances and stuff so it still gives people the opportunity who may not feel comfortable getting back into these areas the opportunity to still experience something special from some of the bands they love so um uh, do you guys have any anything on the horizon in that vein where maybe you're you know doing like uh like virtual performances or or anything like that um we we don't just because of the timing of mm-hmm. like this is it's this thing where like we've spent so much time working on this new music that we're about to roll out and it's been a minute since we've put out a, a new songs like sure. it's not i mean man, you know we're a small enough band that like man if if you're a fan of sync in you've already seen us play all these songs now live like three times <laughs> sure like, there's nothing and we're not old enough yet to do like the, the you know i paid for the starting lines like back to back to back uh, you know, yeah, live performances, live streams, yeah, uh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's because it's 15 years old now. Like, mm-hmm. nobody's going like, man, it's been a year. It's been like three years since that sync in song came out. I need to <laughs> like, feel the nostalgia. I so, <laughs> like, it yeah. just doesn't necessarily work for us right now. But mm-hmm. we're just again, we're just putting all of our effort into this really crazy rollout for for an cool. album and, and a bunch of singles, and yeah. it's just the most expansive. Like, it's the most expansive thing. I've ever done when it comes to prepping promotion for, for music. And like, I, I we're like, you know what? That's just, we're sticking to it. That's what yeah. we're doing. Not changing my mind. There can't be another ounce of focus anywhere else other than that, <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> so hell yeah, man. So let, let's hear a little bit about that. So, you know, without obviously, you know, giving us 
the whole story because I'm sure your your rollout is very carefully planned. But uh, so are, are you doing a series of singles leading up to a record or are you just going to release, uh, you know, singles, you know, kind of part and parcel? How, how are you going to roll this this new music out? We are going to do all of the above. OK, cool. So the idea would be like we're going to we're going to we want to. This is going to be difficult to try and explain without giving it away. <laughs> okay. uh, we're trying to create this, this kind of this, like this world and this entire plot line okay. uh, associated with all of our upcoming music, right? Kind of, kind of like a concept album, but okay. it's all, the concept is within leading up to an album. So like, we're going to have a bunch of singles and then suddenly it'll just be an EP and then back to a bunch of singles, and then it all kind of culminates in this whole story that leads to a record that might not be out for a long time. Okay. Um, but that's, you know, I've never, I've never, I haven't seen somebody successfully kind of create this, this uh, linear plot line with, with their music through mm -hmm. like singles and small EP releases. It's yeah. always in these like big budget final albums. And yeah. uh, I, uh, I love, I mean, I just grew up on so much hip hop that was just built on like plot line within albums yeah all the, of course all the skits all the transitional pieces mm -hmm. like that means a lot to me i think that's, that's i actually think that's something really special now mm -hmm. in, in in the days when nobody actually listens to a full <laughs> album like i think that that's something that keeps people engaged in actually finishing an album nowadays yeah we, um, we uh we just had that conversation with uh with a guest uh, a couple of weeks ago about the difference between uh you know artists in this sphere you know uh you know pop punk punk and alternative artists you know from you know, releasing full records that tell a story from track one to track 10 against releasing singles. And, you know, for me, I, I've always kind of had a, you know, up until this conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago, I, I was always very fine tuned and very much erring towards the side of, well, I like records, you know, I like buying a vinyl, putting it on the turntable and listening it, you know, track one to track 12. And I was always like, I never understood, you know, singles, but then it kind of just dawned on me that um, a lot of it has to do with attention span, right? So, I mean, like, you know, the younger generation's attention span, and I mean, it's, you know, like, like TikTok is, is a huge proponent of that because, you know, you've got these little snippets of 30 and 45 seconds and you go through them, you know, at lightning speed. So it's almost like, you know, if you want to, release singles so that people can just like eat these singles up you know a month at a time or you know every every six weeks and then finally when it culminates into an album they can listen to it the way you intended it in terms of a storyline but be like oh yeah you know track three man that you know i remember when that came out in june that was a banger hell yeah and right. oh shit this is where track six is oh this is awesome i love the transition between six and seven you know so it's i I've, i feel like ha having that notion and knowledge I kind of love the idea now of, you know, bands, especially, you know, newer and younger bands putting out singles because you can really just like listen to it ad nauseum over and over again and really start to love it. And it just kind of peaks your, your, like your, your desire to hear what comes next. So I think that's super cool. So I'm kind of looking forward to that with you guys. I think that'll be dope. Yeah. I, I, like we, we haven't, we're not answering the question of does the album still matter or is it only singles? Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're answering the, or we're solving the problem of how can you bring the creativity back into singles that you have Absolutely. in albums? Sure. And yeah, I, for I sure. Think, I think that's the actual question that needs, yeah. that needs to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're trying to do that. So cool. All right, cool. So I guess um, tell me like, like shopping this out, to, to labels right because are, are you guys currently on a label right now we're not so uh we've we've been we've been talking with with several and uh those conversations get really strange in the middle of a pandemic because mm -hmm. everybody's kind of like every conversation ends with like that's awesome so uh we don't know what we're gonna, gonna do with our own business but uh yeah. <laughs> we do, we'll let you know yeah and then maybe we can work something out yeah like, I literally, I mean, we had that with like a booking agent. He was like, yeah, like I'd like to get started with you guys right now. I'm like, okay, well, what does that mean? It's, <laughs> it's June of 2020. Like, mm -hmm. that's like, great. Okay. Talk in a year and a half. Is that, is that, is that the game plan? Yeah. Cause that's what we might have to do. It's insane. Uh, yeah. So I think that's kind of what we're doing like on the back end when it comes to the business side of things is I think we're trying to build this world, uh, of all these plot lines and themes with these songs and, and, and like small EPs and singles that sure. like the entire time is like, Hey, you're, we're showing you what we're building mm -hmm. and 
you know, like you have in hand what the final result would be because you're yep. seeing it through every all the all these content pieces that we're putting yeah. together. But like we almost kind of want it from an angle of like even the fans know that this album's gonna come in. Like they're gonna know the title. Yeah. And like we like like I, I in my mind I see them being more influential than us when it comes to working out the right record deal. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'd love to go into a, to a meeting again and say like, well, Hey, so here's the deal. Here's an entire Twitter feed of everybody who's asking for this record by name. Yeah. We're going to make it happen. I think that that love holds it. way yeah. more weight than me just saying like, yeah, man, my band's sick. We're going to make you a lot of money. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now is like, we want to create content that, that the people who care uh, will go with us and do the, the legwork with us. But like at this point though, it sounds like you've got, you guys have done like the legwork. So uh, why, <laughs> yeah. So like if why I, then? If give I legwork, this... if I legwork, do you mean like investing my life savings? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah. what I mean. Like <laughs> then why hand this over? Like um, you have this finished product. You can like successfully do it on your own. Like why give it to a label then? I might have an old school opinion here, uh, but I, I think in order for us to do what we truly want to do, we, uh, we need a little bit of backbone in order to get there. Um, okay. Even if that's not through a label, like that might be with a specific agency or manager. Um, like we know what, we know how to create what will be successful for us. We've been working on that. We've been taking the time to do sure. that, right? And like, I always like, I'm I'm treating it as like, hey, built what is going to be successful. Let's work together and put us in front of the right people to make the, to take this to the moon, mm-hmm. um, and, and 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 go from there. I, I, it is so hard right now for bands who aren't signed or aren't aren't on the 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 agencies that matter to get on the right tours what what, what, you know so be it it is really hard to stand out from that ocean without having an absorbent amount of advertising money or having somebody who went wildly successful on their own on social media uh of which we don't have either uh you know i pay rent in los angeles california the other two uh have mortgages yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, that's just the reality of it. Like, yeah, I, of course, you know, there, there's bands that we're in, not not in competition to, but like people that we get compared to all the time in terms of like where we're at in our career. Yeah, like I know their budgets. We're a mm-hmm. three piece. Like yeah. we can't compete with that. I'm not going to try and compete with that. Uh, I don't mind. In, inevitably, I don't mind if somebody takes a portion of the pie if it means that my music gets to reach out to more people because I don't care about that portion of the pie. I care about what I'm creating impacting people on an everyday basis if it means that a new the new ear gets to hear what we're working on every single day but i get a little bit less of that pie that's what i care about Mm -hmm. um so the yes right now it's it's there's a there's a whole ocean that you can jump into when it comes to releasing independent music Mm -hmm. and that's what we're going to do right now um but like i'm not i'm never going to be the person that's like stand stand standoffish to a label if it means that the person that needs to hear my music can hear my music. Yeah. And I, I think, be, yeah, go yeah. ahead. And, well, what I was going to say, and I think to piggyback off of that, it's like, you know, you, you, in the, in the area in which you're in, you know, where you're, you're kind of cultivating this long thread of, of, of content, you know, even if you have to, you know, scale it back to get it into the hands of a label that can extend your reach. I mean, essentially, monetarily we could say it's almost like a stopgap it's like you know i have to pull back now but in five years you know after we've you know taken this from a thousand listeners to fifty thousand listeners at that point i can go to anybody and say well okay you know what we've done you've seen our growth this is what i want yeah and this is what i can do for you and then at that point, and I, and I think that's kind of what a lot of artists have been able to do, um, you know, but again, it's all about, just like you said, your reach, how you can get it to people and the kind of control that you want as an artist. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I think that that's kind of an, an interesting thing. And I think that, you know, e- even the way the music industry is now, you know, predicated on your 
social media reach and your streams, it still kind of harkens back to those, you know, old bands in the 60s and the 70s where it was, you know, like, how, how can you make me money? You know, right. which was like the thing. It, it wasn't really about your, you know, unless you were the Beatles, so, you know, it wasn't about your art. It was just about how can we make money and how can you make Domino Records some money, right? So it's like, right, and it's right. still here and it's still there today, but, you know, in, in a different kind of construct, it's kind of, you know, kind of tumbling differently. So I, I think the parallel. And, and I will, and I will say like, you know, that's, this is all said with the caveat of Sink In has the story of signing the terrible record deal and regretting it. And it basically nearly ruining our careers. I think mm-hmm. we have that it's been yeah. done, but we also, when we signed that deal, we had absolutely zero leverage. It's mm-hmm. just a reality. You know, we were the same band as every other band that, that went and went, Whoa, we put out one song and like a label's going to sign us. Yeah, man, we're going to be huge. <laughs> like, I've done that. You know, I, I, I get it. I get it. And that, and that was, you know, not to, not to, throw any shade or anything like that but uh you guys had worked with standby right was that who it was anybody can do a google search and know the entire story of that (laughs) yeah so uh we'll 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 spare that story because I've, i've 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 heard a little bit about it but um so what i do want to talk about since we only have a couple of minutes left is i want to talk a little bit of puck so um so tell me uh just for for my own knowledge um, you being out in in LA, um, like are like wh- where where do your allegiances lie? Like, are you you know, are you a Kings fan now, or are you like, nah, fuck that? So, <laughs> I literally moved to California the day after the Caps won the title. Oh shit! So I got to ride off into the sunset as a Caps fan nice. uh, due to my my allegiance to the Hershey Bears. Uh-huh. Like, I mean, it doesn't get better than that. I literally, I celebrated. We were in the studio in Arizona. I celebrated by myself, jumping up and down, running through the studio, moved to California and went, that was a good run. Now something new. <laughs> and now I get to go through the dread of being a Kings fan in a, uh. in, a in a full-blown rebuild era. Um, but yeah, so it, the, I was a Caps fan for a long time. And that just sure. stemmed from, uh, from uh, living in Hershey. From Paris, I yeah. Mean, I literally, I literally lived like a hundred yards away from the giant center and Hershey, wow. Hershey Park. That's awesome. So that was my entire childhood. So now, hold on. Yeah. So like, you don't usually see that too often with like that AHL NHL parallel. Mm-hmm. Like Hershey gives me the vibes of like those people that go to those games are AHL hockey fans. They are for sure. I would, I would dare say that 20% of that arena doesn't even know that they're affiliated with the caps, but that's okay. We'll yeah so slide. like t- to hear that you actually like yes you grew up like really close to to where hershey plays but then like took it to the next level and we're like oh i'm gonna now also root for like the big club like yeah. that's kind of rare and, and i think you would I think, think that i did it that make- I, I think i did that because i i always paralleled the ahl grind and the echl grind to like the diy music scene i think oh, that's yeah. why i loved it so much uh, cause yeah, it was one thing to be a, to be an NHL fan, but like, I wanted to know my band before they got signed. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I wanted to know, I wanted to know that third line center who was finally getting a shot in game 58. <laughs> like I've been watching him for two years, man. Two years. <laughs> I love that, man. And I, I love like, man, the, the Hershey bears guys were my neighbors. Like, you know, there's a couple guys who, who, who are on those guaranteed contracts who, who clear waivers and are making a couple million a year. But the reality is it's a lot of 19-year-old, 20-year-old, 21-year-old kids who are all shacked up in a little, like, apartment with a couple other buddies on the team. And, like, they're just your daily neighbors. Like, I would just, like, I would go to the grocery store and I would see Garrett Mitchell and Travis Boyd and the the chris bork and ryan bork the bork brothers like they would just be there just you know at the grocery store there was something about that that was like oh like i get to see this before it happens and i i really i really cling to that a lot yeah and like hershey is like one of those like ahl pinnacles where they 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 sell really well like yeah they're always top like five in attendance yep but then, there's ten thousand. There's ten thousand people a night at the Giant Center. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely crazy. But then also, when you look at the AHL scoring leaders, like 
usually the top 10 or top 20, you'll see a bunch of Hershey bears mixed into that. And Mm -hmm. they always had like those veterans who weren't necessarily NHL caliber, but like crushed it in the AHL. So like you, you mentioned Chris Bork, but then like, it was like, I remember one year it was Chris Bork and Keith, a coin like mm-hmm. he, they, yes. and, and they crushed it. Yeah. And, and then we got actually Keith, a coin on the Islanders. Cause Tom and I are Islander fans and, Sorry, everyone, yeah. and everyone was just like, who, like, this is who is going to be on our team. Yeah. And I like follow the AHL and I was like, you know what? He, he might put up like 15 points based on his resume in the AHL. Right. And he, he just wasn't big enough and he was starting to get old, but that's kind of like the vibe I get from the Hershey bears. Yeah. Those I, kind of players. They always, uh, the bears always had the, always had their kids always had, always had the prospects, but they would always sign a year or two year deal deal with a guy who was on his way down from the NHL who wasn't quite done yet. So, you know, the, in the last years before I moved, we got, uh, we got Scotty Gomez for like mm. 40 games. And that was one of the coolest things ever <laughs> seeing like 40 year old Scotty Gomez. Uh, the funny thing was, you know, he was, a uh, the, he had the, uh, the grandfathered, uh, visor rule in the NHL. That doesn't, that doesn't impact AHL playing. So they made him wear a visor for the, <laughs> so he showed up for his first day with the bears and his visor is here. I mean, it, it's, like, it's like a baseball cap. Just, I mean, there's this is, I mean, I swear to you, it's above his eyebrows. It's above his eyebrows looking like a little, just like the, in, like the white men can't jump hat <laughs> on ice. Yeah, yeah. It was ridiculous. And I, that, I loved it so much. Yeah. I, I have a great Scotty Gumas story and I've told it on the pod already, but he's a beaut. Like, yeah, everything you're saying sounds exactly like him. He's a he's a great dude. Yeah. The other thing I will say about AHL, I'm going to make a big sweeping statement about the AHL right now. It's probably going to make people who don't know the AHL really mad, but that's okay. <laughs> I would say that, and and for NHL teams, their AHL affiliate first line is always better than their fourth line than the NHL fourth line. And I would say that it's probably a 50, 50 toss up between AHL first lines and NHL third lines. I would say that the amount of people who get buried in the AHL just because of roster situations in, in the parent team is, I think if you, I think if you took the all-star team from the AHL every single season, they're making the playoffs in the NHL. I truly do believe that. I, th- I think that there's there's more talent lost in the AHL due to circumstance instead of reality uh, than people realize, and it's something special to see every single night. I totally agree. Like I I, I live in Charlotte, so I go to Charlotte Checker games all the time, and it's mm-hmm. not like when I'm watching those games, I don't feel like I'm watching a lesser caliber game at all. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and sometimes it feels like the game is actually moving faster at times because th- those top lines are filled with some younger guys that are, aren't necessarily at their prime yet, but they just are like throwing their bodies around. Of course. And, and yeah. And I, yeah. I love going to AHL games. I absolutely like if, if you don't go to AHL games and you live in a market that has a team that's close by, like, Give them a chance because it is a it's, it's a quality game. It's twenty bucks to sit in first row. Yeah, I mean, like seriously, I my so my pastime for Hershey Bears was I was not a ticket holder. What I would do is I would go to the ticket holder entrance door at the Giant Center every single night, and because the tickets are so cheap, families buy five season tickets at a time, and oftentimes don't have all five people there, and I would just sit there at the door. And people would be walking in and be like, hey, I'll give you 10 bucks for the extra ticket that I know you have. And it would work every time. What are they going to do? Not take the $10? They're going to walk in by themselves. They're going to take $10 from this punk kid who's sitting there at the door. And I'm going to go watch an AHL hockey game for 10 bucks. Love it. I did it every night. When the band was in town, we'd go, we'd go like all four of us and we'd be like, hey, we got $50. We're going to take four tickets. And it would work. <laughs> we were just right there at the door. What are they, they're going to say no and walk in and not take 10 bucks. We just paid for their, we paid for their soda. Every time. I love those hacks. I love when, like, because it makes complete sense. And it's happened to me 
in Charlotte. So Charlotte used to play where the Charlotte Hornets play, like the Charlotte Checkers, their first couple of seasons coming back, played in an NBA arena. So like, yeah, what, 18,000, maybe 20,000 arena. And we were going to go and buy tickets and we walked just like by where they were selling tickets. And some guy just handed us tickets. And he was just like, Hey, you guys are going to go to the game. Like here, just have these. And that kind of stuff happens. So, you know, I get that hack out to the world. So, you know, maybe even you can catch a game on the cheap or free. Oh yeah, man. So, uh, Oh no, go go ahead, man. I I didn't mean to to cut you off. I was going to say, or just offer to to sing the national anthem uh, every few weeks, but then <laughs> there you go. not actually commit to it, and then you just get the uh, the free program tickets that happened a few times too. But we won't talk about that because I want to be able to go to see a Hershey Bears game again in my life. There you go, dude. Awesome. <laughs> so, wait, did that happen? Like, did you ever sing the anthem? Yeah. There? No. Oh yeah. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I uh, you just you just like apply for it and then you just do like a vague explanation of who you are and then they give you free tickets for uh for like supporting the team. <laughs> oh, that, man. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Unbelievable. But yeah, man, I I love the AHL. I would man, if you're if you're in a market, I. You're messing up, man. It's so much fun to see those to see those guys. Like my pride and joy for the NHL season has been, was watching Travis Boyd with the Maple Leafs this year. Because I mean, like that that guy worked a long, long time in order to get that that opportunity and took advantage of it. You know, he's now he's now up in Canada and man, like dude's making making millions to go and play some hockey. Like you can't beat that for the dude that was just in an apartment with his family down the street who was going to the same grocery store I was. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you made that like connection because it is so true. Like watching an AHL game is like when I went and saw Fallout Boy in 2003 at the downtown on Long Island. Like that's something that I'm going to put on like my tombstone. Like I saw this band before they were playing arenas. Like I saw them when they were grinding it out and sleeping in a van still. Like I take pride in that. And that's kind of maybe why I'm an AHL fan as well. Like that same kind of mentality is just kind of like that underdog kind of mentality is built in me, I guess. That's how dude, hang on. That's how I want to end any influence that I have on this podcast. (laughs) If you're in the DIY music scene, be AHL the NHL don't join the man go against the grain <laughs> AHL is punk rock be punk rock I mean like I feel like we just I feel like the interview just has to end right now I mean that I was like it. that was like the, <laughs> that was the way to 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 end, to end us off um so listen Ty uh you know we, we got to get you back on man just because it was it was a, a blast to, to have you in chat with you man uh sink in doing big things coming up in in 2021 2022 uh hershey bears represent my dog is barking i don't know why she's being such a jerk gonna have to find that out but um dude thank you so much for, for taking the time to be with us um uh, thank you so much for taking the time to give us some insight into what you're up to and uh I, listen man after the king's rebuild hopefully you got a little something but if not you know you always got got them bears because they're gonna be a, a force to be reckoned with in the AHL for like ever so you're never gonna have to worry about that man not at all that's for sure that is Hell for yeah, sure buddy. we'll, we'll talk right. after we'll talk after draft day with the kings let's do that sounds good <laughs> cut and print it man ty thank you so much you have a great rest of your night okay bud thank you buddy thank you guys so much yeah man.